Hello, everyone. I hope you can listen to me. Uh, my name is Vishwa Ranjan Sinha. I, have, I work for IUCN as a Reach Asia uh, Water and Wetland Officer for South Asia. I'm mostly working on the transboundary water governance issues. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, facilitating this very important session on governance and advocacy towards uh, transboundary riverine security in Eastern Himalayas. So welcome everyone. Um, as you can see, just a, a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, you, can, you can see the chat box and question and answer box uh, uh, on the top right of your uh, screen. So try to uh, engage through chatting. Tell us about where you are joining from. We are really sorry for the delay today because there was a technical glitch and one of our speaker was not able to join. So we are working on it. And uh, we hope that uh, from now, things will be smoother. So tell us that where you are joining from and you can put your questions and answers in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, we, will, we will discuss them uh, at the end of the session. So to start with, I would like to um, share my screen and I have just put, developed some slides to introduce you to the objectives and agenda of the today uh, session. So the objective of the session today is to discuss different values and threats to the Eastern Himalayas and what the implications of these threats or challenges are to for the people living within the Himalayas, and especially uh, for the downstream countries like as Bangladesh. Uh, we would also like to explore gender and water security linkages and the role of civil, civil society and community-led initiatives in river governance and advocacy. Um, based on these discussions, so I mean, uh, th this will be presented through uh, reflections from our speaker or the uh, esteemed panelists, which we have uh, put together for you all for this session. Uh, uh, based on these, we will identify strategies for improving governance and advocacy for the transboundary cooperation uh, for the conservation of Eastern Himalayas. So this is basically like, because we are talking about Eastern Himalayas, maybe you people were in different sessions of this forum and you must have seen the map of Eastern Himalayas several times. But uh, be before we start, I wanted to remind everyone that what, what the map of the Eastern Himalayas look like it's a truly transnational region with many countries sharing this important resource. Nepal, Bhutan, but, um, a part of it is in Myanmar, uh, Northeast India. And this, this, this red zone that you see is basically the boundary of the Eastern Himalaya. This is one of the biodiversity hotspots globally recognized. And it is also the source of many of the uh, GBM rivers uh, in the region. So, I mean, basically, if you see this, the Himalaya it's, itself has a smaller boundary, but because this works as a watershed for many of the rivers of the GPM system, the influence of this system is far beyond uh, the actual boundary of the Eastern Himalayas. So basically what happens in the Eastern Himalayas has a downstream impact. And that is why um, we have designed this session today to discuss and highlight the role of Eastern Himalayas as, as the water towers of the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna River basins. Um, this is a, a, I also wanted to show you a little uh, publication from IUCN. Um, it is a bit old, but it, it highlights the challenges in Eastern Himalayas that it is one of the most uh, you know, important in terms of having a number of endemic species like the charismatic the Gangetic dolphins. Um, it is high biodiversity value, but it is also one of the most vulnerable in terms of biodiversity and impacts of climate change. Um, other other things, if you look at the map, you will see that uh, this this there is a challenge in managing the uh, uh, Eastern Himalayas because it, it is part of different countries, so it is under different governance system. So there is a need to cooperate between the countries to really you know save this uh, natural resource. So. I mean, and, and, there, and then because there are pressure, um, like a lot of multi-utility uh, multi uh, water schemes for irrigation dams, they are coming up. The population has increased many fold. Um, there is a scarcity of resources. There is a competition over resources. The region includes one of the most, uh, uh, you know, water scarce uh, regions of the world, like in terms of per capita 
uh, water availability. So, so there are challenges, and that's what we are going to kind of explore through this session today. Um, uh, this is a slide introducing you to the map uh, to the panelist for the session today, uh, Mrs. Hasna Cheshmudin Madhur. Uh, she has been a well-known uh, uh, person in Bangladesh. She has she's a former member of parliament and a well-known big Bangladeshi writer and environmentalist. Currently, she is also serving as the IUCN uh, counselor for Asia. Uh, in the past, she has served as the field director for U.S. Committee for UNICEF and worked as a journalist at UNDP New York Center. She was awarded the United Nations Environment Program Global 500 Roll of Honor at the UN Earth Summit in 1992, Rio. So welcome uh, to you, uh, Ma'am Hansa. Um, we also have today uh, Mrs. Chanda Gurum Goodrich. She's a senior gender specialist uh, and a gender lead at International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, which is an intergovernmental organization uh, formed by uh, uh, you know five countries, including China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, sorry, not Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal. And uh, the, the, the purpose of this organization is to you know, build cooperation among countries for the, the sustainable management of the Himalaya as a whole. Um, including the Eastern Himalayas, Himalayan region. So uh, Madam Chanda has more than two decades of experience with non-for-profit organizations. And uh, especially, she has been involved in building gender strategies and action plans uh, for, for, an, for different organizations and tool for social and gender e equality and inclusion. So um, welcome to uh, Mrs. Chanda. Uh, then we have Mr. Soumya Da. Uh, uh, so Mr. Datta is, uh, uh, is, is very well known in the civil society sector. He has more than 30 years of experience on environmental advocacy and research. He is an advisory board member for UN Climate Technology Center and Network, and also a co-convener for South Asian People's Action on Climate Crisis. He is currently serving as a trustee for the movement for advancing understanding on sustainability and uh, mutuality, which is also uh, called the Mossum. So um, he, he brings his working very closely in Tista River Basin and on, on, on the issue of connecting the civil society and communities to better manage the impacts of floods and uh, 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 you know other uh, water-related disaster. Tista is one of the rivers which originates in the Stern Himalayas and it drains um, a part of Bangladesh also. Um, then we have uh, someone uh, working in the field um, uh, in the Garo Hills, which is part of Eastern Himalayas, located in Meghalaya in India. Mr. James Frank Momin is a naturalist and someone uh, working at the local level on the conservation of natural resources. He belongs to a Garo indigenous community, and uh, he's currently serving as the range officer uh, for the uh, forest division at William Nagar. Uh, in, in Garo Hills as a part of the Garo District Administrative Council. So welcome to you all. And uh, uh, just like I, uh, one last thing, through so, so the way we have designed this panel discussion today is we have short intervention from all the four speakers, uh, starting from Madam, uh, if, uh, Madam, Has Madam Hasna, if she's already there, because we had uh, trouble you know, getting her online. Uh, then, you know, uh, on the gender dimensions, community and flood management in Trista by Soumya Datta and forest and fishery resources management in Simsan River Basins, which originates from the Garo Hills. So the way we were thinking about the session is to have a five to seven minutes intervention from each speaker. And then every speaker will raise a question for everyone us, for every one of us to reflect on. And we get into a pan kind of a plenary discussion, we identify some actions that, you know, different stakeholder groups can take to really conserve uh, this important resource, the Eastern Himalayas. So uh, thank you. Uh, so I would go to the second speaker. We have a recorded mass message from uh, um, uh, Mrs. Chanda from ICMOD um, on issues linked to gender uh, uh, roles. Um, in and water security in Eastern Himalayan region. Good evening. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to begin by saying, by thanking the organizers for inviting me to 
uh, uh, give a short message in such a critical issue as, as water insecurities or water security issues you know, and uh, gender relations. Uh, because I think that gender dimensions uh, really play a very critical uh, role when we come or when we talk about water insecurity issues. And now just to unpack this a bit, you know, you know, as we know, water is something that is uh, a resource pool that is really getting scarcer by the day for a host of reasons, uh, including climate change and, of course, anthropogenic activities. Uh, that's going on going and as a result I mean as you said this is uh, this is a natural resource which is really getting scarce I mean we already find in our region in the mountains that uh, drying up of springs ground when the plains the groundwater uh, really uh, receding um, and so people are really facing a lot of uh, I think uh, insecurities not just to water because of water then food energy, all these are very much uh, closely interlinked. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, how gender dimensions play out or how gender dimensions rather uh, influence this what is insecurities for certain groups of society, society is that, you know, gender is a kind of a very uh, fundamental organizing way of the society, you know, by assigning roles and responsibilities to men and women, you know. I mean, that's fine, you know, you can assign, but the problem arises is that when this uh, organizing is based on unequal fitting, yeah, it's not equal, uh, equal. So what we mean is that because the way that the roles are differentiated between women and men, and the access and control over resources, you know, whether it's natural resources or other productive resources, also differentially distributed between men and women. Men and, men, uh, and uh, as a result, what we see is that women in general have less uh, access, or even if they have equal access, definitely in terms of control, they have very limited control over these resources as compared to men. Uh, and this is basically because our societies, communities, over here are largely patriarchal systems uh, where, I mean, there might be slight variations. However, it's the large under base is the patriarchal system where, you know, uh, men are in control of the decision making uh, as well as of the resources that is really important for our lives and livelihoods. As a result, gender dimensions or gender relations really influence how, what access, what level of access we have, what level of control uh, men and women have. Now, when we talk about men and women, we also does, don't mean that, you know, uh, binaries of just men and women, not that women are a homogeneous monolithic group, neither are men. There is a uh, intersectionality in this, you know, whether you talk about age, you talk about uh, ethnicity, class, caste, uh, you know, and there are also the host of other fluid intersectionalities or access that uh, cut across gender, that is, uh, for instance, you know, disability, poverty, uh, marital status over here, number of children or number of sons or daughters. So that also play play out to uh, give uh, access and control or to give power or voice to these groups of men and women. Now, essentially what is happening in the water sector with the scarcity of water decreasing is that, um, you know, there is, there is more competition to get access and control over this resource. So when there is more competition, obviously it's natural that the more powerful, you know, the hegemonic group has more control and access over this resource. And in our case, in the case where the gender structure is based on a patriarchal system st structure, obviously it's the men. And that also men who belong, who come from the more uh, powerful class or a higher caste, you know, or any, any other powerful social uh, group that have more control over this uh, uh, resource. And as a result, uh, the other other uh, groups of get completely sidelined and they become very depend dependent on these groups to get access to this resource. So the insecurity arises. And we also have been seeing cases that where, you know, there have been conservation strategies and practices. This conservation strategy and practice is getting more and more individualized. You know, there's less of uh, what you call collective action to do these practices of conserving. And when it is individualized, again, it is in the hands of the powerful. So even for conserving, you know, these uh, women, especially from marginalized groups, do not have that. I mean, we've been hearing cases in the northeast side of India where there is community-owned resources, including land and water. Even here, the 
leaders of that community, which is which happens to be the older men, are selling off these common pool common resources to private uh, people so that you know you know the water market is a flourishing market now so that these private individuals or these private groups can sell the market and so the women or the poor who had been accessing water from this common lands now are debarred from that so the insecurities really in increase uh, due to the prevalent gender skewed gender relations that's happening and now to raise a voice against if this minority group whether it's a women or the poor raise a voice against this often when this conflict is also larger between communities or between states or between countries so when a particular group raises a voice the thing is that the notion is that you are going against the larger uh, group you know your what you call your disadvantage is not as big as that of the group. Let us get first from the group and then you can fight for these. So, so this is a question, this is an ethical question or a moral question always placed before the disadvantaged groups when there is this larger conflicts happening. So now the question I would like to leave with the group is how do you, uh, how do you see this kind of uh, viewing or the framing of the, of the disadvantage or the vulnerable group voicing their rights you know is it really uh, how do you see that so is it is it a moral duty of theirs that they should keep quiet till the larger insecurities or conflicts get resolved or i should it go parallel so that's a question i think uh, thank you very much uh Bachanda. um uh, uh, it was great to hear from you you also highlighted about the challenges um, in the Eastern Himalayas, like the spring, uh, drying up of the spring, which is a water security issue and which affects women more than the men. And then this issue of unequal access and whether, um, uh, and, and, and generally like the collective action is, is not happening. And do we need to wait for this very important issue that you raise is that of course, there are a lot of different types of security insecurities and and uh, um, you know differences among the, uh, the stakeholders in society, among the different communities in societies. But so basically, you are saying that shall we wait for everything or the development to happen first, and then we raise the voice of the marginalized group, or that should it should happen parallelly? Because many times uh, this is a kind of argument which is uh, put forward: is that oh, there are so many different kinds of inequality. Uh, let's you know first address the you know, imp you know, the one which we can, and then we will look at the gender issue. But what you are highlighting is that gender is very much uh, center of any uh, any strategies around natural resource governance, and we have to understand how we integrate those concerns. So thank you. Uh, so with this, I think uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to invite uh, our other speaker, uh, Samyada. I mean, if you're okay, I would like you to. Uh, you know, share your experiences because uh, from the Tista River Basin on the, you know, role of civil society in, in bringing people together for collective action uh, and to, you know, uh, address some challenges. So over to you, Samyada. Uh, please introduce your topic and uh, tell us what you want us Thank to you, And uh, Namaskar and good evening to everyone. Uh, one thing, just one small correction. Uh, the uh, name that along with that the affiliation that has been shown i was the advisory board member of un climate technology center till this april so my term has ended so i've handed over to the next person so i'm a, now an ex-member so with a little bit of correction i just start on this see my experience of working in uh, river basins i have been working in the tista basin in the bhagirathi basins also and narmada but here i'll only talk about since it is the eastern himalayas talk about the tista basin work and uh, what are our focus areas or focus areas and then what kind of attempt we made to break some of the uh, difficult uh, questions or break down difficult questions and find answers in wherever uh, whichever areas possible uh, as uh, this was mentioned that uh, downstream countries like bangladesh i just wanted to point out also that Almost all of these countries in this region are downstream countries. Even India is a downstream of Bhutan and China and many others. And we face the consequences of lack of understanding, lack of cooperation, lack of sharing data and information, 
So this is a continuous and uh, continuing ongoing problem that we have faced. The other problem that we face in these transboundary river basins is uh, there are two major issues that we uh, need to address. One, the governance of river basins and governance of transboundary river basins in particular have been looked upon as the exclusive domain of governments or authority, whereas numerous communities, riverine communities who reside there are the ones who actually suffer from any ill effect or benefit from the river's uh, gifts. So one of the major understanding differences that we try to correct is that governance of uh, transboundary river basins, the riverine communities on, the, on those river basins has a major role. One of the work that we did uh, from 2015 onwards, uh, and uh, part of the time I was working through Mosam Network, part of the time I also consulted, I was a consultant to uh, international rivers. I developed uh, with at the, for a program, I developed a uh, uh, community river governance curriculum because what we realized is people by the uh, riverside, the governments, the agencies who are responsible for uh, governing the rivers, all of them look at the rivers as certain cumex of flowing water. A river is not just a pipeline, not just a big pipeline. A river has a lot of life around it. A river has cultural, spiritual, a uh, lot of other connections with the communities. So if you look at the governance mechanisms, if you look at the agreements, you only find, find how many QMEX will be shared by whom. Oh, the demands and other hand demands are increasing. Demands on what? Demands on so many QMEX. How much flow will go to irrigation? How much India will get? How much Bangladesh will get? This how much only mentions the flow volume. There is no question of if you take out this much volume, what happens to the river, what happens to the uh, uh, aquatic life, what happens to the uh, trees and uh, plants around. So one of our efforts was to bring this very important aspect that a river is not just a volume of water flowing. It has a living entity. And this living entity has an uh, added complexity here because there it's not just one government that is the uh, sort of administering or governing this, it's multiple government governments. And here I would like to point out one small thing that transboundary rivers is not only when it crosses a river, crosses an international boundary. Even within India, this problem is very, very clear. In fact, you keep on hearing how Sikkim and West Bengal, the question of uh, sharing Tista's water, how Tamil Nadu and Kerala fights, how Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh fight. So this is predominant. And this boundary question, the political boundary, it's not a geological boundary. It's not a geographical boundary. It's a political boundary that we have artificially imposed upon. The rivers were not bound by these political boundaries, whether uh, to begin with or even now. So that question needs to be addressed and understood. So one of the, as I said, one of the major issues that generally is lacking from all river basin governance uh, discussions and uh, particularly from transboundary river governance discussion is the role and the importance of communities who are present in those river basins so one of the major as i said tasks that we did is bring in communities from both uh, bangladesh and india but we have also interacted with communities in bhutan on these issues so bringing them together making them understand or increasing their understanding that the river has multiple linkages, multiple connections. The river itself has its own need. Its ecology does do need water and many other things. The second major task we did, and this is also connected to a major problem. There is a major lack of trust, the trust deficit between communities on two sides of a political boundary. And again, this trust deficit is also within one country between the uh, two sides in the two sides of the political boundaries of our states and of course within uh, uh, if the question whenever whenever it comes to international boundary this communication which can break down the trust deficit to some extent becomes even more difficult so in this case in the tista basin what we did is we means uh, it's not my personal work only we did it as a collective but the work involved bringing bangladesh and indian communities together both on the Indian side and on Bangladesh side, getting them to see the river from upstream to downstream and up to whatever extent they can travel. And then 
have discussions on those issues that they are complaining about. So this has really helped break down the trust deficit. What we saw is that instead of accusing uh, Bangladesh communities, accusing Indian, India doing this on this stuff, Indian community says, why should Bangladesh have this kind of thing? So this question of Indian community saying Bangladesh. So this has got now in the areas that we have worked, got transformed into what the governance is, who is actually governing, which of the uses that these problems are being caused by, and this problem of uh, accusing communities just in a broad sweep, communities across the political boundaries. Now this has got transformed with better understanding into saying, OK, the dams are causing this problem by unregulated uh, water discharge. The barrage has caused this problem. So there is a the third angle now to come to because the time is short, is that uh, throughout your governance system, people and communities in the river and basins, river basins have very little role. So as a third uh, initiative, what we have done is we have started uh, making uh, contacts through the communities, brought the communities to the governing authorities. Like the Tista is governed, the uh, large part is governed by the Brahmaputra board. So what we have done is the communities which are living on the banks of the Tista and on the, which is called the Chor lands, the uh, river islands. There are uh, lakhs of people, hundreds of thousands of people living in those uh, river islands, which is very, very, uh, uh, very, very vulnerable to both climate and normal river uh, operation. So what we have done is empowered these communities, brought them together in dialogue with the authorities, quote unquote authorities who govern the river and then demanded that in the governance structure, like how the barrages are operated, how the Gajaldaba barrage is operated, how the dams are operated, what kind of release uh, system should be, uh, should be adopted, brought the communities together in discussion with the authorities who are right now at in charge, hoping that going forward, these communities will stake their claims and probably it's not easy task because the authorities by our governance structure, which we inherited from the British, we always say it's our, the government has a right, government has the eminent domain and people have to follow. So breaking down that structure and mindset is not very easy, but this has started already. So this is the third angle that we have done in the Tista Basin, Tista River Basin. And the fourth area that we have been able to do is through this exercise of uh, pilot projects, a uh, little bit of trainings. Of course, I must uh, say that when uh, we started on this, it was uh, it took took off, but then this coronavirus, uh, the COVID lockdowns came. So the last uh, pilot uh, and training in Bangladesh was in February 2020. After that, throughout the lockdowns came and uh, put a spanner in the work. But I think this has this work has got huge promise because we have been within that short span of a couple of years of work with very limited resources. We have been able to break down the trust deficit across the political boundary. We have been able to bring communities into the governance discussion. We have been partly successful in bringing the communities to understand that it is not just a volume of water flowing and they need this much of water. We have been able to understand, we have been able to uh, successfully uh, sort of uh, instill a sense in the communities and also to some extent acceptance in the gov authority, authoritarian governance structure, which still exists that the river needs to be looked into in a much broader perspective than just the flowing water. So river needs to be looked at as a living entity and that living entity is not just the, bio, the, eco, uh, the biodiversity, the ecology, it's also the people and everyone has a right, nobody has an exclusive right. So these are the kind of uh, challenges, but last one, let me uh, point out the trans particular issue of transboundary rivers in the Tista Basin. As you know, the Bangladesh-India border is quite tense because of continuous migration. And Tista being a mountain Himalayan river, the floods, flash floods are very, very frequent. Now it is happening almost every year. And uh, both the banks are uh, tremendously affected, both in India and Bangladesh. But the most affected people are the river island people, the Chor residents. So, and as I said, Chor residents are hundreds of thousands of uh, people. And the, some of the chores are in the, the boundary between India and Bangladesh runs through some of the chores. So this, that boundary there is a little porous. But what happens is 
because the border area is patrolled by i'll finish within one minute patrolled by bsf who do not speak the language of the people the language of the people is bengali the uh, bsf the uh, army or the bsf there they speak either hindi or rajasthani or haryanbi and whenever people have to cross over to india because they cannot go to bangladesh to a, for a very long distance india is very close whenever there is a flood a lot of people on the chor lands on the bangladesh side because as i said it's a very porous border on the river islands they try to go to the indian side and the kind of exploitation particularly women and small women with children they pass they go through the people when they go for the markets and others the kind of uh, difficulties the kind of extortion they face so all these are major issues and this needs to be looked into from a larger cooperative mode not only from the government but also from the people's the community's own perspective so i'll end say uh, end by saying that, that when you look at governance of transboundary rivers one the transboundary is not just international boundary it's more than that and the second most important thing unless the communities the riverine communities are taken into full confidence their capacities are increased through their understanding of what a governance river governance is what the river is and their capacity to really challenge and interact with the authorities who now govern the rivers will not really be able to solve this problem this problem cannot be solved by a indian government authority by a bangladesh government authority by a bhutan government authority this needs to go beyond that thank you thank you uh, very much samadha have you you have raised a lot of issues and uh, this has been a challenge uh, it, it, not just in this part of the world but generally like around asia that um, different stakeholders or sectors have water requirement and we always look at rivers or the water secure security from uh, the volumes perspective uh so there is a need to expand this dialogue and include ecosystems perspective community livelihoods perspective and also uh you know how you uh, kind of um uh, empower the local community to understand and challenge the policy decision and also kind of contribute positively to it at the transboundary level and how the local people are suffering because of issues around erosion and floods so i mean i just want to uh, reemphasize here that if we want to manage floods or erosion which is a problem which is a big problem in tista river basin we have to also look at what kind of development is happening in the upper stream how we are managing the watersheds of the tista river which is basically the eastern himalayan region um so those are, those are the things that we also need to connect with and then we need to highlight that the rivers are the living entity so now i think i would like to just uh, i mean now we i would like to invite uh, mr james frank momen but before that because he is from the garo hills and we have a very interesting uh, kind of uh, video so let me just try to show you this is a video from um, a fish conservation sanctuary in uh, garo hills and i will just show you like within 30 40 seconds we're trying to give you what it means i mean this one highlights how community stewardship can play an important role in in kind of conserving the uh, uh, fisheries and other resources can everyone hear me so this is a uh, one of the uh, fish sanctuaries and uh, this is managed by uh, the local village um and they have identified a site for conservation and i would just like to take you to that site. this is one of the sites and what you see is the golden mushroom here which is one of the endangered species and it it lives all across the eastern himalayan region and is an important source of uh, food and livelihoods for a lot of people and and local community here have identified the site and they can serve and you can see the 
kind of, uh, you know, and being even though it's in danger, you see the numbers in which they kind of turn up in this region. So, to talk more about it and other issues around forest and biodiversity conservation, I would like to invite James now. So, hello, James. Hello. Uh, over to you. So I hope everyone was able to hear. Were you able to hear the the sound of the fish, James? Yes, we were. <laughs> so the, the, the editor of this video is James himself. So welcome, James. Okay, thank you, Vishwa. It was like really nice to finally hear from you again. And uh, good evening, everyone. We have attended this um, meeting. Uh, Okay, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm working as a range forest officer in Garu Hills. And while I'm working here, uh, like uh, the, the first thing that I'd like to um, tell you about Garu Hills is like our society is a matrilineal society. So uh, the ladies, they have the power over the community, the clan, they are called the uh, Nokmas, the clan leaders. And the power shifts from the mother to the daughter. But in practicality, uh, since the woman, they have to look after the kids and the household, the power is usually shifted to the husband. So uh, it's okay to a certain point, but uh, some individuals, they are, some individuals or some of the clan members, they usually are like self-oriented and then they misuse the actual power of the ladies uh, and then uh, they exploit the land, the resources. Uh, it, like our society, our community is blessed with a lot of biological diversity. But uh, in recent years, there's a lot of depletion of resources. Uh, it, there's lots of felling of the trees and then a lot of development is also going on. It has caused a lot of erosion and uh, deposition of silt in the river way, rivers and the streams, which has caused a lot of uh, destruction to the, uh, uh, to the fishes in the streams that like, and then the, so, uh, in 2002-03, uh, most of the communities, they have initiated a self-awareness team and they have uh, started this uh, fish sanctuary for the in indigenous species. But they, what they did was they didn't introduce any fingerlings from outside. All they did was conserve the certain spots, certain pools of water in the streams, and it in, uh, it resulted in like the the video, the one that you sh uh, that that was uh, that was shown by Vishwa. It resulted in this kind of uh, fish sanctuaries. Okay, the, like the challenges are usually based on the development done by the government. And the over exploitation of the forest and the resources, uh, like there are a lot of uh, road developments going on in the villages, which has uh, resulted in destruction of forest and and the land itself. Uh, so, and then the when the roads are paved, uh, there's loss and uh, like there's less absorption of the rainwater. So all the rainwater, it gushes down to the uh, stream, which causes uh, the force of the uh, water to increase. And plus with the removal of the stones for the stone quarry from the stream, uh, the current doesn't slow down, which results in the erosion of the banks of the streams and the rivers. And the, the, uh, the, it also results in the position of the silt in the bank, uh, in the stream itself, or in the river, river, river beds. Uh, lastly, I like to uh, put up this question, like, is development 
more important than the future of her children or the fate of fate of the planet. Wow, very big issue you have raised here. So I think uh, thank you very much, James. So I mean, because you are somebody working at on the ground and you understand the realities, and uh, you you highlighted some of the issues of how communities are kind of conserving the indigenous species and resources in the Garo Hills, mm -hmm. and the issue of uh, mining and infrastructure development and the impact it is having having down the stream. So and then you the issue the is broad broad. Mm -hmm. yes. Broader, uh, but uh, like with the time limitations and uh, uh, I haven't prepared much, so like with the less amount um, amount of time, like it was very difficult for me to highlight everything into one uh, one session. Yeah, sure. I think I completely mm -hmm. understand that, but I think uh, participant must have seen the video and heard from you, and uh, mm -hmm. you have raised some important issues. Uh, about uh, the need for the development to be more conservation uh, uh, you know oriented and uh, you know integrating natural or the economics of the nature because mm -hmm. nature provides us a lot of ecosystem services which many times we don't value in economic terms so there's a need to do that and you know highlight the importance of these resources for local livelihoods and water security so and now i would like to um, you know, invite uh, uh, Madam Hansna for uh, for you know sharing her perspective. She's coming from a government background and has a wide experience, and also from representing a downstream countries which is fed by the rivers originating in the eastern Himalayas. So we would like to hear her perspective uh, uh, on on the uh, you know the, the need for conserving eastern Himalayas and what it it means for Bangladesh. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. I have actually joined to learn what has been happening and the Meghna knowledge. Uh, the study group is uh, eye-opener. I really appreciate that so much has gone since my own active years as a organizer of people's initiative for water sharing sharing the Ganges water with Mr. Kuldeep Nathri, eminent journalist of India. He and I put together uh, Women for Water Sharing and then it became a People's Initiative for Water Sharing. And I'm very pleased to say that our guidelines that we had recommended were the basis of the, the, the Ganges India-Bangladesh Agreement and uh, that was possible because Mr. Kuldeep Nair's friend was at that time Prime Minister. Needless to say, it is the political will. It is the political will particularly of the region's strong members that is responsible for a uh, cooperative, uh, uh, sustainable and management program for international river. The moment a river crosses the border, it becomes an international river. There are so many instances in the world. The Mekong River, you know, not very far from us. And the rivers in Europe, in uh, Africa, in uh, South America, there is no other river left which we can say that uh, is not managed by the Kurai variants. As a matter of fact, the Ganges Water Treaty, which is far from perfect, it has not yet been renewed and it still uh, follows the uh, political decision makers uh, power or uh, uh, what to do by the uh, upper riparian country and uh, to this my Nepalese friend says sister don't worry we are upper riparian but uh, India doesn't leave it to us they can take water out you know uh, by so many other means diplomatic pressure by trade-off and whatnot. So my concern here is that so much work, good work has been done. And there's so many dedicated people. Change must happen. You know, it takes a group of people to change. And in this day and age, if we cannot 
bring together. You know, I look at uh, Bangladeshi rivers as my river, and India looks at the Indian rivers as their rivers. So we can't blame anyone. They all belong to us. The river itself says, I belong to myself. The ecosystems that are, uh, that are um, uh, uh, you know, dependent on the river also claims. So river is a life-saving lifeline, particularly Eastern Himalayan countries. I'm very concerned because I know that ancient forests are no longer kept safe. I have heard from Bhutanese, uh, a royal family in Bhutan, they say, she said, that no, no, you're wrong. There are many forests that are deforested in Bhutan, which uh, we wouldn't know, we don't live in Bhutan. So there are areas where uh, patchwork of deforestation is taking place. And I urge that IUCN, Bolipara, and all other conservation groups should make sure that the ancient forests are not touched. We cannot recreate the ancient forests. We can, however, uh, curb or uh, suggest differences for unsustainable, uh, unsustainable practices of the hill people or the indigenous people. But we cannot ask them to move out. They have a right. In fact, their right is greater than uh, the rights of the. Uh, lowland people and so human beings will go wherever they can due to climate change which is so severe in every country you know it is severe in the mountains it is severe in the delta areas and so we have to be prepared for climate change adaptation oh my god adaptation to poverty is one thing but adaptation to huge huge loss of land of huge loss of water and good crops is not possible by the poor people we are telling people and women and youth to do everything we must bring our governments into confidence we must bring international bodies we must bring iucn the united nations to follow its own resolutions and make sure that this land is saved, the ecology is saved. We don't even know what we are losing. There are many people who claim themselves as, as aboriginals. They have also come from somewhere. Where will they go? So therefore, it is not just the right of the aboriginals, but it is the right of humanity to make sure the land rights of the aboriginals are respected land rights of those who have nothing those who are floating the floating population or refugees or whatever you call them they also have a right to live therefore here is the greatest challenge of our time the mountains are covering up the hills are covering up but we don't know what the mining industry might do we don't know what the logging industry will do we don't know <clears throat> what the hydropower companies will do and this is all being decided by the stronger neighbor by the stronger partner of not that nobody knows everybody knows who is doing this but we, how do we bring them to a sort of a day? Let's look at it as a pan-Indian vision. Let us all work together to bring sense that if Ganga doesn't leave, you don't leave, I don't leave. You know, something like that. It will happen not too far away in future. It will happen. And therefore, we must be prepared. We must sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our children. We must make sure that we leave a better planet for future. And there is no time. These uh, forests work as corridors, ancient corridors. And there are so many fantastic trees, species that are not even known to us. So we must not destroy what uh, 
for example, I just, just saw the little fishing. I, I congratulate you for it. But you see, the nature's way is to uh, the fish will ride upwards, spawn, lay eggs, come down, and it has to have a safe passage. The David Attenborough has said that the uh, world's ocean is more at peril because of overfishing rather than by plastic, microplastic, because I'm very concerned about microplastic pollution and all other runoff from the land to the sea. So what happens to the mountain happens to the mainland and to the sea. So we are all connected and let us work together and let the brave men and women and youth come together to save our beautiful Eastern Himalayan region. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for those, uh, those uh, nice reflections and the need for the international collaboration to conserve the Eastern Himalayas. And you raised the important issue of uh, uh, conserving the ancient forest. I mean, I really like that term. So the, uh, because deforestation is happening, there are issues of mining and uh, uh, you know deforestation that is impacting the Eastern Himalayas. But ma'am, because you are from government, sometimes you know as 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 government and as stakeholders also we are like a bit. Uh, I mean, um, you know, in a conflict situation, I would like to share one example from the Meghna River Basin, uh, from where uh, James also belongs. So Garo Hills is part of the Meghna River Basin. And what we see is that it's a very interesting, um, uh, 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 what you say, relationship between the sec economic sectors uh, between Bangladesh and uh, uh, and India um, at the local level. So a lot of mining which is happening in the Indian part is actually feeding the cement industry both in India and also in Bangladesh. It's an important source of truth, trade. So I mean, here is a here is a situation where. So mining is happening somewhere, but it's feeding the industries in other countries. So, I mean, th th these are some kind of a situations where actually countries can come together and, you know, identify ways to kind of stop it or find a better way to do it. I mean, what is your uh, thinking on that? I mean, uh, around this, some strategy. So, because one, I would like to really hear from you one suggestion on for for a specific advocacy from the Bangladesh perspective for, for protecting the Eastern. What, what is the one priority issue that everyone needs to kind of advocate for? Can, hear, please? Can I suggest something? Yes. You know, we, we need to respect international laws and norms. That is enough. You know, if you follow international laws and norms, of the delta of international river management even that will be a very big difference this is the change we want that we follow the un conventions and norms and to protect our rivers we don't have to invent new laws just concentrate on the laws that has been signed by most countries and try to follow them thank you Thank you uh, very much. I think so. This is a very important advocacy point which is emerging today from your uh, speeches. The need for uh, to advocate for the uh, implementation of international water law principles. And if we talk about uh, shared river basins, uh, there is a clear at at a UN level there is a convention, uh, UN Water Courses Convention, which actually based on the customarily customary principles and guide provides the guiding principles on how to you know manage a basin how to integrate environmental concerns how to manage disputes between different stakeholders so i think those are the things that we can learn from and advocate for in the region to build collaboration at regional level for the conservation of eastern Himalayas. so thank you very much madam uh, hasna um, uh, thank you very much for joining the session uh, because of the time constraints so i will directly now go to Samya Dada, um, Samya Dada request you to, you know, just have your final reflection and one suggestion for advocacy. Sure, I have quick two quick suggestions as uh, uh, points of action, uh, not necessarily only advocacy. One is 
uh, bring in all river governance, transboundary river governance structures and mechanisms, bring in communities from both sides. Uh, and communities means these are not only because we are talking about Eastern Himalayas, this has to be communities from the mountains, communities from the plains, the upstream, downstream in all senses. The second important suggestion is in on planning, don't look at rivers only as QMEX, as flowing of a certain volume of water flowing and talk about like India Bangladesh talks about Ganga or Tista, how many QMEX we will get. Talk about the river, plan, the, plan for the river as a whole, plan for the river as a whole biological entity and then on the basis of equity and fairness. Thank you. Thank you, Swamila. So I think clear message here that we need to uh, bring in govern, govern like uh, com, well, I mean, kind of go governance from different levels together. So I mean, engaging communities also in the discussion. And one very important point is uh, talking beyond water volumes. So as 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 a group, what we can do is that we can advocate for expanding the scope of water dialogue and including, um, uh, you know, environmental concerns. Uh, into it, what kind of ecosystem benefits we are getting, and how different kinds of benefits could be shared. How, what are the trade-offs which are required to share to, to kind of ensure that benefits are equitably distributed, and it is not contributing to the degradation of the Eastern Himalayas. So now I would like to go to James. Um, last, I know I mean you raised a very important question, but what will be your suggestion for different stakeholder? to advocate for well, I, Himalaya, Himalayas and water security. OK, uh, I think uh, we have to focus on conservation and preservation of indigenous species uh, so that the relation, the biodiversity relationship is still maintained and the link is still there. Can you cite one example where you see that we, because of not conserving indigenous species or because other reasons has actually have a big impact at the local level. I mean, if you can think of any example. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, suppose, uh, supposedly for the fishes, uh, since uh, if suppose if uh, we take, uh, for example, mashir, mashir is omnivorous. So it will feed on anything. And at a time, at times, so if if there's a limited resource of uh, food supply, they become carnivorous. So, abundant food supply, which is locally and then which is uh, supposedly to be present in the water, should be there. So that uh, none of the link, uh, okay, so none of the fish species, other fish species, is also. Uh, be, uh, hindered and then like uh, uh, nothing will be uh, like in a uh, so like since they are competitive the species should they should have a relationship and then uh, the focus for every species should be all, all there okay so so the point here is that we have to understand the role of indigenous species in the ecosystem of Eastern Himalayas, what economic value they are bringing, documenting mm -hmm. them and preserving them. One of the things that has also been highlighted by uh, speakers today is the lack of documentation and less information available on different aspects to actually kind of work on policy and planning process. So thank you very much, James. Uh, yes. And thank you. The, uh, Bisha, yeah. may I respond to a question that has been posed? Yeah, sure. I think we have a question there. Yeah. I think the question is, or the, it's a question and a comment combined. It's a kind of regional forum to bat for the Himalayan glaciers. If you look at the realities of today, in the Himalayan, if you look, talk about Himalayan glaciers, the one problematic uh, interface on the Eastern Himalayas is India and China relation. But if you look, if you go beyond that, for the time being, you leave that apart. Nepal, India, Bhutan, together and taking Bangladesh into confidence because Bangladesh is a lower riparian state which gets both the hit and the benefits of any action. So this kind of uh, act, this kind of forum in a sense existed earlier. The SARC was supposed to be a forum where Himalayan problems are also 
were included. Sark had a very clear role in the climate planning of the region, Southeast Asian region, South Asian region. So, uh, of course, this kind of uh, you mentioned about uh, Ram Madhav talking about this, but it's the BJP government and the Pakistan, India Pakistan problem that has uh, put an almost an end to the Sark. In fact, Shark had many of the issues that uh, were under discussion and some kind of declaration. If you take in the climate issue, the Thimpu declaration, the Dhaka statement, many of these were talking about Himalayan glaciers, climate, etc. So it's going back to that time, but these are uh, hostage now, hostage to political uh, sort of uh, political play. But this yes, is sir. one essential thing, and I would uh, like to just add in half a minute that what I suggested. As a third suggestion, I think it's an extremely important uh, action that we do now on all these Eastern Himalayan rivers. We have not planned taking climate change impacts into account. So whatever actions we do now, whatever planning we do now has to take into account the impacts of climate change and how it will change rivers and how it will change the regions. That needs to be taken into account very seriously. Thank you. There are studies so think... available now. Yes, like, so climate change uh, impact. Yeah, I mean... studies are there. Yes, and Himalaya is one of the most climate impacted region. But I would just like to add here, uh, based on the question about uh, you know forum for Himalayan glacier, there is already a forum which the countries sharing the Himalayan region have created, which is the International Center for Integrated uh, Mountain Development (ICMOD). So there exists a platform, uh, but I think the focus of this platform is very much on the Himalayas itself. Uh, maybe we need some kind of a more upstream, downstream approach to advocate for the conservation of Eastern Himalayas because this raises a big issue. The countries sharing the reach, uh, you know, the land which is a part of the Eastern Himalayas or, or, or the communities living there, they also need to develop, and that is leading to you know changes. So, what are the different you know ways that it could be conserved and benefits could be shared with the downstream countries? Um, uh, in in economic terms, so we need such mechanism. But I I, I agree. I mean, I understand that already a platform exists, which is IC mod. And I really liked if 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 something like a regional parliament can happen for for the Eastern Himalayas. Uh, so thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, the participants today. Um, it has been an engaging discussions, and I think it is just a starting point. Uh, of uh, uh, the need to expand the discourse on the conservation of Eastern Himalayas to include water security issues and inclusion of community in the decision-making process. So with this, I would like to again thank everyone and end the session. Have a good thank evening. Thank you, Balibara Foundation, and thank you, Bishop. Thanks, 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 of course, to the Balibara Foundation. Keep, keep going and keep doing this. Bye.